I'm going to give you a, um, a starter introduction to decision modeling um, in health technology assessment with reference to cancer. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, just an insight into some of the dark arts that uh, health economists use uh, to, to help decision making in, in healthcare. So what we're going to talk about today is just obviously some introduction to what decision modeling is. Uh, why we use it, uh, what a good model looks like, and then uh, focusing on some specific types of model that are available for use. Uh, I focus on uncertainty in decision modeling because that's that's really critical. And um, thinking more about the role of uh, decision modeling early on in the innovation pathway as you are with, with OncoEng. So, um, so decision, decision modeling, start off, I, I apologize, it's a pretty dry uh, definitions here, but uh, a decision analytic model uses mathematical relationships to define a series of possible consequences that would flow from a set of alternative options being evaluated. So what we're essentially trying to do when we're building a decision model is to create a simplified version of the patient pathway, which is going to capture the major um, events as they pass through the care pathway in terms of the costs and health events to them, things that are gonna influence uh, their level of risk, the quality of life, survival. Okay, so we're trying to create this representation and we do it in a bit of software. Quite often it, it's Excel, uh, you know, I'm afraid, afraid to say that Excel is probably the most common used bit of software used, but, but um, Nowadays, we're moving more into R, and there are specific pieces of software that you can use for modeling like Simulate. Um, so we create this um, uh, simulated pathway for all of the technologies that we want to compare. And for those technologies, we estimate the expected costs and outcomes, which is essentially the sum of the costs and outcomes of each consequence weighted by the probability of that consequence. So essentially, we're using this uh, representation to try and make decisions in the face of uncertainty. Okay, and we're we're applying costs and outcomes, which might be qualities, uh, and we're multiplying those by the chance that these things are going to happen. So we're creating expected values, and we're using those at the end of the modeling process to get an idea of what the total costs and benefits are of all the technologies we're comparing to help us make a decision. Now, you'll be familiar with this, this quote from George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. The decision models we create uh, are certainly going to be wrong to some degree, um, but the point is that they help us make decisions. And uh, in using these decision models, we are going to make better decisions. We're going to make better allocation choices in terms of what we do with our healthcare resources than if we just did things randomly. So to, when we're creating these representations of, of, the, of the care pathway, we, we acknowledge that reality is tough to represent. In cancer, as I said in the last talk, there are so many different um, healthcare technologies that, that can be used, so many, so many complications, health events that can happen to patients along the way. We can't really capture all of those. So models are left sort of complex enough so that it's still useful and capture the major costs and benefits, but simple enough to be doable in terms of the evidence base and you know, the, the user sophistication. So we, when we created our model, our um, care pathway, we've got to populate it with, with evidence, with data. And that's going to be in the form of unit costs, uh, so that's a form of the technologies, the, the treatments that, that we're using, healthcare resource use, hospital stays, GP visits, etc. Um, the effectiveness of the course of the technologies that we're, we're evaluating, health state valuations, or well, that's utility or um, quality of life values, and um, epidemiological data as well. So survival data, risks over time, that, that kind of thing. And uh, we're, we're using all this data and we're putting it into our model. So at the end of it all, we can generate costs and benefits and estimate uh, what I talked about last time, which is the 
the ISO, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So oh, where do we get this data from? There's lots of different sources. Could be we have our hands on individual level data, which might be observational data or from trials. Could just be aggregate data from systematic reviews or meta analyses. There are unit cost database that give you the costs of hospital stays and GP visits, et cetera. And uh, lots of databases that, that include quality of life estimates. Uh, but, but in your case, and, and in lots of cases when we do decision modeling, there actually isn't much evidence available. And in, in that case, we can refer to expert opinion or expert elicitation. And there are uh, formal ways of uh, eliciting values from, from experts, which include uh, Bayesian methods. And I've just listed one there called Shell that was created by Sheffield. So what, what should a, a model look like? Okay, so we should be populating it with the, the best evidence we have available, ideally for meta-analyses. Um, it's got to be a, a realistic picture of the current clinical practice, okay? It, it's got to reflect what actually happens, let's say in the, in the NHS at the moment, uh, in terms of usual care has to include all the relevant comparators. We can't cherry pick which comparisons we make. And we've got to run it for the appropriate time period. Um, a decision model should be run for long enough in terms of the time horizon to make sure that we're capturing all the relevant costs and benefits to patients. It has to be valid, transparent, and reproducible. Uh, these decision models are the cornerstone of all uh, nice decision making. Every medicine, pretty much, that is uh, evaluated uh, for use in England and Wales, at some point will have been uh, uh, been part of a decision model and evaluated by a decision model. And those models are submitted for scrutiny by nice and independent research uh, groups. And these models have to have to. Uh, explore uncertainty and characterize it. Okay, there's lots of papers out there which cover good practice in terms of modeling and what we should be doing in, in uh, validating our models. Okay, I haven't really talked about what, why, why do we actually do this? I talked last time about the fact that the um, all healthcare systems are constrained. We have budget constraints. We have to make choices in the face of of those constraints, okay? And um, economic evaluation is a tool to help us do that. And decision modeling is a specific tool within economic evaluation that is used for this purpose. And um, as I said, most evaluations that, that go through NICE will be based on a decision model. Um, it allows us to pull together lots of evidence from different places, whether it's observational data, different trials, and we can put it all together in one place in a decision model to estimate cost effectiveness. We can use these models to extrapolate costs and benefits beyond the data that we have available. Uh, we can explore the thresholds and scenario values which might be relevant to us if we want to understand, for example, um, what's the most that we can charge for a medicine and still be cost effective. Um, helps us to characterize the degree and source and source of uncertainty. By the use of sensitivity analysis, we can see what is driving cost effectiveness. So what the key uh, factors are in, in the value of our particular technology. And it can help us to really isolate where we should be focusing our efforts in terms of future research to reduce that uncertainty. And when we're doing modeling in early on in the innovation pathway, it actually gives us insight to the viability of a new technology. Is this actually going to be plausibly cost effective? Uh, and we can do that when we've got very little uh, cost and effectiveness data. And just, just to illustrate one of those factors here, why we use models, in this case, to extrapolate costs and benefits. In this scenario, it's a hypothetical one comparing surgery and ra radiotherapy. Uh, we've got utility or quality of life on the vertical axis and 
survival or time on the horizontal axis. If we run a clinical trial comparing surgery and radiotherapy, we can see that over a period of 24 months, actually, those patients receiving radiotherapy have higher qualities. They've got better quality of life than those in the surgery group. If we stop our trial there and conduct our economic evaluation, um, we're essentially ignoring all the flow of costs and benefits beyond that point. And that's where modeling can play a part to help us extrapolate um, those costs and benefits beyond the period for which we have data. If we didn't use a model beyond 24 months, we would effectively be ignoring all this area under the curve, which is quality benefit um, for radiotherapy. And we'd be making potentially um, uh, the wrong decision and certainly underestimating um, the value of, of radiotherapy. So that's just, just to start with, to talk about um, what a model is, what a model should look like, uh, why we do it. And I'm going to focus now on some of the types of modeling um, that are available. There, there are lots of types of models, <laughs> spoiler alert, there, there are loads out there. Um, and some range of very simple to, to, to very complex models. Most common types of model are what we call cohort or aggregate level models, where we model hypothetical groups of patients flowing through this care pathway that we've created, um, accruing costs and benefits as they go through. Uh, they're more simple because there, there's no interactions there. These are not infectious disease models. Uh, and these include decision trees, markup models, or combinations of these, and um, something called partition survival models. Other types of models are available. Um, and as I said, they get increasingly complex. So discrete event simulation, for example, is a type of modeling which allows you to look at um, constrained optimization problems. So if you have a hospital ward, given the number of patients flowing into your hospital, uh, and the, uh, the amount of queuing you want to allow, how many nurses, beds, and um, doctors do you need to, to ensure that you're treating people within a, a given time? So that's what more complex models can give you. But when we're choosing a model type and thinking about the model structure, we've got to ask ourselves questions such as, what well, is interaction important? Is it an infectious disease? Well, then no. Um, is the disease um, subject to recursive events? Yes, so, so are the relapses possible? Um, if so, that means you've got to pick a particular type of model. Are you interested in the history of the patient in terms of you know, the previous comorbidities, whether they smoke or not? So all these factors would influence what, what type of model you choose and the level of complexity you need. So just focusing on simple decision trees to start with, um, we have essentially a flow diagram uh, showing a logical structure of the problem. We have a decision to make about um, how uh, we treat a patient, what technologies we might apply. Um, there are certain events that can happen with uncertainty and these le le um, lead to outcomes. Okay, um, and these, these flow diagrams, if you like, represent the possible prognosis following an intervention um, by a series of, of pathways. And it outlines the decisions, the probability of various outcomes occurring and the valuation of each outcome as, as we move through this pathway. Decision trees are most useful when health events don't repeat, they happen quickly or not at all, um, and when the effects of treatment are over quite quickly. So they're not, in truth, actually used that much in cancer um, the most commonly used areas in diagnostics. Here's a, a simple example here. Uh, in decision trees, time flows from left to right, and you can see these uh, branches emanating from the blue square. And um, we have a blue square, a green circle, and a, a red triangle here. And these are nodes. The, the blue square is a decision node, so that's where we choose whether to give treatment A, treatment B, and the circle is a chance node. So this 
uh, will have related to it probabilities, which are so associated either with risk or the effectiveness of different treatments. Um, and then we have the triangles, which are what we call terminal nodes. And that at the end of this process, that's where we calculate the uh, flow of costs and benefits um, throughout those branches. So if we were going to look at the uh, one of the uh, decision problems that OncoEng are dealing with, so patients with metastatic bone disease and spinal pain, um, if we have to make a decision about how that, that patient is treated or which, which interventions we should fund as a healthcare service, we might consider three alternatives here. This is a very simplified uh, example. So a minimally invasive implant, which is, would be our new technology, surgery or cement, uh, which are two versions of standard care. If we're going to try and model that for each of these options, we need to know what events might occur, the probability of each event, the consequences of those events, and the outcomes. So um, qualities, for example, and the costs associated with the technologies themselves, but all of the health events. So if we start with our um, decision node, we have three possible technologies that, that we can use and that we're using this model to evaluate. And we might say, well, okay, one, one event that might happen is that there's a probability of fracture, okay? And uh, after receiving one of these three treatments, patients might um, experience a fracture or no fracture. And obviously if they have a fracture, um, they can have worse quality of life, worse survival, higher healthcare costs. Okay. And then we might say, well, okay, if they have a fracture, there's a, a probability of spinal cord injury. And if that happens, of course, there's an increased risk to um, uh, uh, of mortality, worse quality of life and, and higher costs. So in a very simple way, we can think about how we might model this decision problem. And then what we would have to do is assign costs, outcomes, and probabilities to our decision tree. And I suppose you might hope if, if your new technology is effective, um, there's gonna be a higher probability of patients who are not gonna have a fracture. And so the, the, that cohort of patients are gonna have lower costs, uh, better survival prospects, and, and higher quality of life, which when we solve this decision tree at the end of it, um, you might expect there to be higher qualities and lower costs for that particular intervention. But yes, so we, we apply those um, model parameters to our uh, decision framework. We calculate the conditional probabilities. So that's the um, probabilities of each of these pathways happening. And then we multiply those um, costs and outcomes by those conditional probabilities to get expected costs and outcomes. And we sum those for each of the pathways. And at the end of it, we would have um, the cumulative costs and qualities for each of those three technologies. And we can um, do our usual economic evaluation and, and estimate the incremental cost effectiveness ratios and net benefit. So that's decision trees. So moving on to some more complex example, which is uh, Markov models. So they're more compact than decision trees. Uh, one of the things you may have, one of the problems you may have noted with decision trees there in that specific example is that um, actually uh, this technology that we might apply um, doesn't just happen once and the event might not just happen once. Um, you might avoid a fracture for six months, but then uh, in the following six months, there will be a risk of fracture. So that needs to be, uh, model as a, as a recursive event and Markov models are much more useful for that. Um, and so they're, they're structured around mutually exclusive disease states representing the, the consequences of disease and the interventions. And they're most useful when, as I said, health events repeat over time or have long-term effects. So if we're looking to model costs and benefits over the remaining lifetime of patients, for example, 
Uh, and if the risk of different health events does not depend on patients' prior history. If it does, if we need to take into account what happened to patients previously, we need a more complex, probably individual simulation model. So in a Markov model, we use uh, Markov health states. So health is split into distinct categories, and these are mutually exclusive. So uh, people in your hypothetical cohort can't be in more than one health state. These are complete, so individuals must be in one of them. And patients are in one state at a time for a fixed period, which is called a cycle, which might be a week, uh, a month, or a year. And at the end of this cycle, they can either stay in the health, the same health state for another period of time, or they move to another health state. And so the, I'll show you what that looks like. This is a very simple example of, of a, a Markov model with three possible health states. Okay, we've got well, sick, and dead. And um, these arrows actually denote what, what we call transition probabilities. Okay, so these are all the possible ways in which um, our cohort can move between these health states. Okay, so we can see that if a patient is in well, they can stay in well, they can move to sick. If they're in sick, they can get better again, they can remain in sick or they can die. Uh, etc. Okay, dead is, obviously is an absorbing health state, uh, and people who enter that health state stay there, obviously, till the end of the modeling period called the time horizon. So that's a very simple Markov model. And uh, those uh, arrows, as I said, are uh, denote transition probabilities, and those probabilities um, are, are basically our estimates of effectiveness for our treatments and the, the risks associated with that, which could be complications, for example. Now, although I said that was a, a simple Markov model, actually the most cancer uh, evaluations are based on a three-state model. And that is as presented here, um, that we have a stable disease or um, disease-free health state, we have uh, disease progression and then dead. So this is by far and away the most common representation of, of cancer in health economics. Uh, there are you know, obviously more complex versions of this. If you think that there are uh, important health states that need to be captured, and they're important because um, they have distinct quality of life or survival impacts and distinct costs associated with them. So in this more complex example, um, we have um, more health states, and this is uh, from breast cancer. So we've got disease-free, uh, no adverse events. We've got contralateral um, and, and various uh, degrees of um, metastatic disease and recurrence. So models can be as complex as, as you like, really, but um, they just need to be complex enough to make sure that you are capturing the major events um, that are relevant to the decision problem. Of course, when you're making models more complex, there is a danger where you get to a point where actually you don't have the data to populate the health states. So for example, if I had a health state here, which said, um, okay, breast cancer with, with distant recurrence uh, after the third line of treatment, which might be fine, but would I actually have a quality of life estimate for that group of patients? Would I have survival estimates for that group of patients? So this is ju just to illustrate what happens here. Again, we, in a markup model, we start off our hypothetical cohort of patients across our um, health states, and we apply um, a Markov matrix, which is a group of probabilities. And uh, that effectively means a patient's transit between the health states after one cycle. And we continue to apply those, um, that transition matrix, matrix or matrices for the lifetime of the model until we get to the end. And, and in cancer modeling, it's usually what we expect to be, um, it's either 100 years uh, the average age of the patient or when we expect most of our cohort to have um, 
uh, to have died. And then at the end, we sum up the cumulative costs and um, qualities over the cycles for each technology. And then we can estimate the, um, uh, the ISO again. But we do, for any costs and benefits beyond one year, we need to think about discounting. And there are uh, specific guidelines about um, the, the level of discounting we need to apply. So that's decision trees and Markov models. Uh, what you might see is um, in the literature is something called partition survival models. Now, health economists don't particularly like these, but in actual fact, most nice technology appraisals use this approach. And this approach essentially uh, uses survival modeling. Um, and in this case, we've got survival uh, model for overall survival, OS, progression, and progression-free survival. Uh, and um, the, the area below this curve is um, the progression-free um, member state. So uh, we use these survival curves, and in most cases, we'll use a range of different parametric um, survival approaches uh, and you know, justify which one we think is most appropriate, and then apply a quality of life value um, for the period of, of those um, survival um, health states and work out costs and benefits in that way. So this is the most common uh, approach to modeling that, that we see at NICE. Just a quick note on budget impact models. They're not decision models as such, but it's a way of estimating um, what, the, what the overall budget cost impact is, is likely to be on a healthcare service of new technology. And it, so the most complex part of this really is establishing um, what is the total eligible population uh, for your particular technology, uh, and then working out what your cost of your technology is and uh, the healthcare resources that we use and, and how that differs to current practice. So as I said, there's no decision rule associated with this, this form of model, but it is used at NICE uh, if a technology um, is uh, evaluated uh, and we, we find that there's um, a budget impact of more than 20 million within, I think it's the first two or three years, then there'll be some negotiation about price. So, okay, that's just a very quick introduction to different types of modeling. Uh, as I said at the top, uh, uncertainty is, is critical in, in um, decision modeling. What you'll probably know is that if analysts are creating models, actually we, we've got quite a bit of freedom to be very strategic and to game the, the framework to, to get out answers that we, we want and to cherry pick data and to put that into our, into our model. Um, and so it's really important that the uncertainty in our modeling process is captured. I briefly mentioned this last time, but there are, there are different ways of doing that. Um, so one way and scenario analyses involve effectively uh, adjusting our model parameter values and then observing what the impact is on the outputs of our modeling. So if we, for example, change the price of our technology in our model, um, how sensitive are the cost effectiveness estimates to that? And uh, oh, there are various other forms of sensitivity analysis listed here, threshold analyses. So how, for example, how effective does our technology need to be um, given a particular cost for it still to be cost effective? Um, the, the bottom one also I mentioned last time, and it's probabilistic sensitivity analyses. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, but this is the approach where we, we don't, uh, use a point estimate anymore in our model to define parameter values, but we specify a distribution. And the shape of that distribution describes the level of uncertainty around the data going into our model. And uh, we use Monte Carlo simulation to, to run our model, let's say 10,000 times. Um, and in that way, we, we capture the uncertainty that we have about our data. So if you're running one-way sensitivity analyses, you might report the results like this called tornado, tornado plot. And effectively, um, it shows the impact on the, 
the ISA, uh, given changes in various parameters that are listed on the on the left hand side there. And we can see that um, the, the top the top parameter there, quality of good function after our procedure, is the most influential parameter. But coming back to probabilistic sensitivity analyses, um, we know that events happen with a, a certain degree of uncertainty, um, and we can characterize this in the form of probability distributions and density functions. And when we do modeling, we, uh, we will input these distributions into our models. So if we consider a, a model here with these different parameters, relief, recurrence, probability of having to go to A&E, being hospitalized, et cetera. And each of these being described by not just one mean value anymore, but a distribution uh, representing that value. We can run simulations to choose a value from that distribution and for each time our model to estimate cost effectiveness. So we do that, as I said, maybe 10,000 times so that we're inputting distributions into our model and we get an output of distribution, okay? And of course, what these distributions tell us is how uncertain we are about the data. The, the more pointed the distribution, if you like, the more certain we are about that particular parameter, okay? And these ones that are more spread out means we're effectively more uncertain about it. So the more uncertain these distributions, the more uncertain we will be about cost effectiveness. And that's really important for decision making. Because as I said last time, we're never really in a position to say 100% that something is cost effective and we should be funding it on the NHS. Uh, one thing that we can do with these all these uh, simulations is, is uh, create what I mentioned uh, last time, something called the cost effectiveness acceptability curve, which plots the probability that our technologies are cost effective across a range of willingness to pay thresholds. And we can see here, we've got three, uh, I think these are lung cancer um, medicines, electinib, serotinib, and crizotinib. And we'll see that, you know, depending on what we're willing to pay for a quali, uh, at different points, each one has a, the highest probability of being the cost effective option. But if we're willing to pay, let's say, uh, 25,000 pounds for a quali, then chrysotinib is the most likely uh, to be cost effective. And that's the optimal option. Okay. So that's um, just a note on uncertainty. And um, I've got a few slides here about the role of early modeling uh, in, in innovation. I talked there previously about the parameter values and where we get data from. And also I said that actually we can start this modeling process very early on in the innovation pathway. This is typically sort of the, the flow of uh, evaluation or, or health technology assessment that we have very on in a process. We've got the development of technologies with, with academics, patients, clinicians feeding in. And then later on, uh, when we approach implementation, this is typically when uh, technologies go to HTA agencies such as NICE, and that typically is where um, health technology assessment happens. So decision modeling, uh, cost effectiveness alongside clinical trials tends to happen later on. But there is a push for this process to happen earlier on in the process, uh, and it does have value. In, in this particular part of the innovation pathway. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with this term, te technology readiness levels, but it's something that we're coming across more and more in terms of the, the surgical medtech cooperative. And what we're realizing is that actually economic evaluations and decision modeling can be applied in very early stages of uh, technology readiness. So why, why would we do it? Okay, in the absence of any trial data, systematic reviews, you know, what actually is it going to tell us? Well, we, we can still use values um, related to plausible cost effectiveness. If going back to our um, example on the, um, uh, whether we use cement surgery or uh, minimally invasive uh, implant to avoid fractures, 
we actually probably got very good data for two of those in standard care. So we, we probably know what the effectiveness is, what the risk rates, quality of life, the costs associated with, it, with those two. Um, but the values surrounding our new technology, obviously we're going to be limited on that front, but we can rely on plausible estimates, thresholds, to get an idea of uh, whether this, uh, these technologies should be developed, whether they um, should be continued to be developed, to identify where there are gaps in the market. Uh, we can use this model to inform technology development. Uh, which aspects of our technology represent the greatest value? Uh, is it in pre preventing fracture? Is it in increasing quality of life, reducing pain? Uh, actually, when we run our model, are the cost effectiveness estimates not that favorable? And so therefore, do we really need to concentrate on um, thinking about you know, you know, saving costs? Also, we can use this process to inform research priorities. Okay, in our sensitivity analyses, what are the biggest drivers of value? Okay, where are the biggest areas of risk? And um, there's something called value of information that actually I think it came from engineering uh, many years ago, but has recently in the last sort of 15, 20 years been applied in health. And it actually allows us to quantify, to put a cost on the level of uncertainty in a decision. We know that um, when we're making decisions in healthcare, uh, if we make a wrong call, then it's going to lead to suboptimal decisions, and that risks uh, reducing the overall health of the population that, that we're serving. So the consequences of those incorrect decisions mean less health, okay? And that's the opportunity cost. As I've already said, in terms of the probabilistic sensitivity analyses, what that tells us is there's a probability that our new technology is cost effective. Well, then it also tells us it's a probability that it's not cost effective. And that if we choose to go ahead and fund it, that we've made the wrong call. So we can actually use this information to, to generate and to estimate something called value information, which is essentially the probability of making the wrong call multiplied by the consequences. And the consequences depend on the size of the population, the patient population, and the health consequences. So obviously, if you've got a decision um, that's going to potentially affect many thousands of patients, then the consequences of getting that wrong are significant. And at that point, um, we know the value of further information is increased. And so we might say, actually, uh, it's too expensive in terms of the cost of uncertainty to make a funding decision right now. What we need to do is to go away and collect further evidence on particular areas, which could be the effectiveness of the, the technologies. What else can early modeling give us? Well, something called headroom analysis that allows us to effectively work out the maximum price that is achievable um, given all the other parameters that we estimate in our model, what's the maximum price we can, we can charge and still be cost effective? But it can also inform something called the target product, product profile, which is uh, being used more and more in, in diagnostics and medtech, which is essentially um, a, a list of desired and expected properties of new technologies. And so it could tell us what is the minimum characteristics that, that we want to see from, from our technology, for example, in terms of effectiveness, in, in the example uh, that we had, uh, what's the reduction in the probability of a fracture um, from our minimally invasive implant? Um, what's the minimum we need to achieve to be cost effective given a particular price or cost of the technology? And we can do things like uh, two by two sensitivity analyses by plotting the price of new technology and effectiveness and explore lots of different combinations of those and, and, and plot the range at which our new technology is still cost effective. Okay, so I'm, I'm approaching the end now. So just summarize very quickly that 
Um, decision modeling is, is widely used in health economics. As I said, it's, it's used in every nice evaluation. Um, it is just a tool for decision making, but it is a very influential one. Um, it has lots of uh, different um, uh, values to the decision making process, it helps us combine data, extrapolate, uh, can help us plug the gaps in data we have, and it helps us put a, a value and a cost on the level of uncertainty to point, pinpoint what is driving the, the value in our um, technology. There's lots of different models out there and um, how complex you want to get uh, and which type of model you use depends on the decision problem. Um, and early modeling uh, can be very useful early on in, in the innovation pathway and, and you know, could be applicable in, in, your, in your program in establishing the value case uh, to inform research priorities, what to focus on, where to save money, uh, whether, whether to uh, continue investment in it. Um, you're gonna be able to use cost effectiveness estimates to uh, potentially convince funders to, to uh, invest in future research, for example. And it could also inform uh, tar target product profiles and, and pricing. So I've put a bunch of reading there. There's a couple of books at the top, which are very good for, you know, if you if I piqued interest and really interested in taking this further and some papers below that, which are introductory modeling papers uh, and um, best practice in terms of modeling. Okay, and I'll stop there. Um, then we've got some time for questions. So I'll stop sharing if that's okay, Rebecca. Absolutely, thank you so much, David. That was fascinating and um, really uh, important for the work that we wanna do through Oncorange, but I think also um, brings a bit of a different perspective to much of the work that probably many of us are involved in across the board. So thank you ever so much. Um, okay. So we've got some time for questions. Um, I'm not quite sure the easiest way of doing this. Certainly, if anyone wants to put their questions in the chat, um, I can read them out. Or we might have the option that people can raise their virtual hand somehow and I can get you to answer the question directly. Um, OK, thank you. We've got one up from Oliver. Oliver, do you want to try just unmuting and see if it works if you then ask your own question? Or maybe I'm pushing the bounds of... <laughs> pushing the bounds of reality, but mm -hmm. does that work, Oliver? I can try. I can try. <laughs> well. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, can. got you, Oliver, Brilliant. thanks. That's okay. Um, my question is, because you're talking about early modeling, um, so our suppliers to the NHS or to other healthcare settings, are they currently kind of integrated well enough to allow for this long-term modeling so that by the time the drugs get to the NHS, they're able to afford them? So, you know, I, I, it sounds like a very sensible point that if you can model yeah. along this whole supply chain, you don't end up getting something which is too expensive, so there's no point in using it. But is there currently the kind of infrastructure to model along that whole pipeline, if that makes sense? Um. Yeah, I think I think I get your. I, mean, I don't really. There isn't that kind of pathway modeling. The, the modeling that happens at, at, at present is uh, a, a discrete, usually a discrete part of the pathway, uh, comparing the all the relevant technologies. So if we if we think about cancer medicines, for example, uh, and value cases submitted to Nice, it will be the new technology versus all the relevant comparators just for a specific defined period and uh, a decision is made on that basis. So uh, uh, and there are a couple of elements there. If, if something is just too expensive, um, then there will be negotiations about price. Um, sometimes there are other uh, factors at, at play. So for example, when the new hepatitis treatments came out a few years ago, I can't quite remember the name, but Essentially, um, they were offering a cure for hepatitis uh, and they were highly cost effective. But if they were offered on the NHS, it would have bankrupted the NHS. And there was no 
capacity in the system to get those treatments out to, to patients. So what essentially they did was, was said, we'll do 10,000 at a time. We'll treat the first 10,000 patients. And then as, you know, as, as we go along, we'll treat more patients. Um, so, but, but when those treatments, those decisions are, are made at NICE based on the modeling, those, those drugs have to be available within three months by law, okay? But that, that's medicines and it's different for the technologies that, that you're looking at. Um, and so I don't think early modeling would be sufficient to inform uh, commissioning, but what it does inform is, you know, you convince funders to give you more money, money to, to pursue this because it's potentially of value, investors. Um, and so, uh, you know, the next stage, probably after early modeling would be obviously collecting data in patients that gives you a signal of efficacy, whether it's observational data, probably most likely. And then from that point, you might be in a position to go to commissioners or, or NICE with a stronger evidence case. I hope, uh, I, Oliver, has that answered some, at least some of your question? No, no, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I actually had a, a kind of kind of related question, David. So it was yeah. it, it, it popped up in my in my head in one of your earlier graphs where you had um, your chart of um, quality of life versus surgery and radiotherapy outcomes. Yeah. And um, you commented obviously that if you stopped a clinical trial at a particular time point, you didn't have the forward looking information about what happened after that point. And of course, I guess as patients are hopefully living longer and longer, that becomes more and more relevant. And, and you commented that one of the values of the models is that you can forward extrapolate what might happen for an individual patient in time. Yeah. Um, so my question was, of course, I understand you can you can forward extrapolate, but um, how do you know that you're extrapolating correctly? Because it's very hard to have data to validate those long-term predictions, given that I guess they're for the patients who live the longest and they might not have got there yet. Yeah. Um... You don't, <laughs> basically. I mean, we know, for example, in, in cancer, um, gosh, it really is sort of, um, when it comes down to it, quite often, best guess. So we yeah. might we, we might know what the, um, the expected survival uh, probabilities are, let's say at five years for lung cancer patients and 10 years. So we, we tend to, look at uh, externally validating what the predictions are for the model in terms of you know, those survival predictions. Uh, so we can do that and we ask, we ask clinical experts and, and clinical experts are usually at, at nice meetings giving their opinion about what is the most e uh, plausible extrapolation. But actually when it comes to new treatments uh, where we, we really don't have a clue what the future um, the longer term benefits might be. And, and the most recent examples are in immunotherapies in cancer, where the, the mode of effect is such that uh, obviously sort of it trains your immune system to, to keep fighting the cancer, even if you stop treatment. So there could be benefits way into the future. And, and so in those cases, we really didn't have a good idea um, what, what the most plausible estimates were um, and we pre so obviously the company obviously go, go for very optimistic ones usually which which put their treatments in the in the best light and then the external groups will go for a pessimistic version of that and we have to make a, a almost a qualitative judgment about what is most likely there are you know there are ways of um technical ways of dealing with that called um model averaging but mm -hmm. to be honest that is very rarely used and, and we, we tend to come back to this sort of qualitative way of, of looking at it thank Great you question. that's really helpful do we have any other questions from from the virtual yes. audience i'd love to know is anyone thinking about you know these kinds of things for you know, in, in, in the programme? It's a really good, it's a really good question. So 
I don't know if Richard's there. We, we, we didn't formally, I don't think, plan to do this kind of, um, you know, work directly within the grant, but but we we are doing a lot of thought around, you know, how we should be considering the technology development pipeline. Um, and, you know, you talked about technology readiness levels, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we're doing quite a lot of thinking around that piece, the kind of translation of the technologies that might come out of this. And I think, of course, the next piece in that puzzle is, of course, to do this kind of um, modeling. I think it's something that we should consider, Richard. I think you're absolutely right, Rebecca and uh, David. It, you know, if you're going to generate new devices or new services, then you really need to understand you know, the economics of the situation, how you're going to justify whether your device will actually, you know, enter, you know, clinical, uh, and, uh, you know, enter the clinical domain if it's if it's science and technology and innovation, uh, you know, is successful. I think uh, we did bring on board Sarah. I don't think uh, Dr. Fields with us today, but so we did bring on board Sarah and she's come from industry rather than, than from an academic background in terms of knowledge exchange and knowledge transfer and she's quite keen on this actually that you know that we do some form of you know economic evaluation so I think over the next uh 18 months or so I think we're going to you know steadily steadily develop that so I think in that sense I think it's going to be positive I think it'll give I think not only does it give you uh better appreciation of the economics I think it gives you a better appreciation because you have to do the groundwork, as it were, and how this device is going to end to clinical services and what are the potential barriers. Because, you know, it, it makes you think of, uh, think of more about the process in general. I think it also makes you talk to a lot more stakeholders than perhaps you otherwise would do. So I think it's, you know, I think it's a useful exercise, not only in itself, but because, you know, because of what it does, you know, to your perspective and wider thinking. I, th I think as well it would... It, it makes us think from the beginning and thinking of the design and all this kind of stuff, um, the feasibility of it, you know, what kind of impact on outcomes it would this kind of device would need to have in order for it to be commissioned. And, you know, if there's ways that we can think about the design of the device and its manufacturability and all this kind of thing, which can impact on that balance, then I guess that's really important for us to factor in from the beginning. And it's this kind of thinking that might actually frame some of those arguments for us, which I think it would be incredibly valuable. It's uh, it's interesting. I was just on the phone earlier today with uh, Jonathan Stevenson from uh, the, the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital in Birmingham, I think it is, and we've set up a meeting of surgeons who do uh, surgical oncology, and there's a big meeting, perhaps representatives of each of the major units and some of the minor units, in fact, that do this sort of surgery. You know, whether it be the long bone, the pelvis, the spine. Um, the school or whatever so uh, and he was on about that you know you know we you know not only do bringing the surgeons together give you the clinical need you know but it also allows you to develop you know relationships and then go on go, go on and help with this all this you know product introduction health economics you know what do the people actually want to make their patients a you know a better quality of life or maybe extend life in in certain cases you know and what do the surgeons want you know Obviously, we know they want an easier, quicker, minimally, more, more, more minimally invasive operation. But what does that mean in practice? And I think all these kind of ideas impact on this kind of, you know, on this health economics. So if you use for, uh, you know, where we, where current oncological surgery has a maximum exposure, you know, it's big metal work, lots of rods, lots of screws. You know, patients are recovering, you know, over 12 weeks or whatever, you know, for many of these patients, it's a significant proportion of their predicted lifespan with this disease. So, you know, moving from that kind of maximum exposure to a minimum exposure would be, a, you, know, you know, a game changer for them and a game changer for the patients. But there are, but there are challenges, you know, we can, you know, we could probably estimate the economics, but there are kind of, I think, implementation challenges about the ways about the pathways that present patients go through uh, the oncology service and the disconnect, I think, to some extent between uh, surgeons and the rest of the kind of oncology family, as it were. Okay. Brilliant. 
I think like we'll be following thing. up. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. And we're, we're already talking with you, aren't we? So, um, yeah. yeah, well, thanks again for, for inviting me. And uh, it was really nice to, to connect with you and some great questions there. And um, yeah, I hope the, the rest of the, the, the day goes well. And uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, yeah. David. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for your time. Thanks.